How many of you, is this the first time that you've seen Cuban posters like this? In person. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I, that's what some, something that's so special about this exhibition, I think, is that, um, you know, a lot of us have seen these works online, but to see these posters in person, to see the way that they were printed, to be able to get up close to them is a whole nother experience. Um, so we're really, really excited to be opening this, this exhibition today and to have all of you here. Um, for those of you who I don't know, my name is Hannah Craig. I am uh, a coordinator of art and culture here at the People's Forum. Um, and today we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of the attacks on the Moncada Barracks in Cuba. Yes. And the spark of the Cuban Revolution, which um, is a continuing uh, a amazing project of socialism and, and just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. Um, and, and we're just so excited to be celebrating the amazing victories of Cuba and its revolution. Um, and what an amazing way to celebrate Cuba and its history um, with, with these posters, with artwork, with culture. Cuba has played such an important role in building culture. And I especially want to uh, recognize and celebrate Aire Santa Maria. Who of you know Aire Santa Maria in this room or know of her? An amazing, amazing revolutionary. She was part of the attacks on the Moncada barracks. And after the revolution, she w went on to become a, a founding director of Casa de las Americas, which was and it continues to be an incredibly important space for art and culture all across the world, um, and is an amazing space um, in Cuba, in Havana today. She was a catalyst and a bridge between revolutionary movement and culture, and we will always remember her. I want to uh, thank all of the people who made this exhibition possible. Of course, the, the people who work here at the People's Forum, um, who hung this exhibition, who uh, made this show come together. Um, I want to thank Jasmine Nicole Williams, who is here today, an amazing artist and murals, muralist, <laughs> who you're gonna hear from later on today. Um, but I wanna talk today about these works, uh, this, this celebration in New York at the People's Forum uh, of these amazing works of, of art and the threads that this exhibition kind of pulls together. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the influence of these posters and why they had so much success that they did. I wanna talk a little bit about internationalism and how we might take the lessons from these experiences, from these works of art and apply them in different contexts in our current moment. So I want to talk about art as a weapon. If you've been to the People's Forum programming around art and culture before, you've most definitely heard us talk about art as a weapon. Art is constantly being used by the ruling class to instill ideas about the world and our places within it in our everyday consciousness. And there is no doubt that it's been successful in a lot of ways. And as the working class, we must too take up our own banner of art and culture and wield it as our own weapon. So the posters in this exhibition are an example of this at its very best. Many of these posters were part of an international distribution of hundreds of thousands alongside the Tricontinental Magazine, distributed by the Organization of Solidarity with the People of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So uh, I wanna talk a little bit about Felix Beltran, who is the artist who made that amazing piece right in the center, celebrating the 26th of July. He was a leading graphic designer for the revolution of Cuba, and he said, the poster could circulate in countries where a functionary was never allowed to speak about the ideas of the revolution. The magazine and its poster, multilingual um, and triple folded with inside of the magazine, um, exported a vision of the, of the revolution to the world. Um, it, it was a variety, 
it was kind of a disguise in some ways people people would say and um and it was it was able to be distributed in all of these places where other people weren't able to go but what made these posters so intriguing one thing is the tools and the philosophy that was used to develop them so i want to go back to felix beltran who by the way we are commemorating this year he passed away at the end of last year in 2022 and left behind an incredible legacy so felix beltran came of age as a young designer before the 1959 revolution and he attended some of the most prestigious design schools in the united states he actually was right here in new york city we really should do a, a tour of cuban art history of new york city because there's a lot to learn even in our own backyard but he learned the tools of commercial art at its very height in the 1950s. And he learned the scientific approaches to art and design used to communicate, which was shifting at that time. Technology for printing and communicating were changing. The, the moment was ripe to develop and innovate around ideas and practice in terms of design. So then armed with those professional tools, Felix Beltran moved back to Cuba in 1962 and started to build a revolutionary visual language of the, of the Cuban revolutionary process. And <clears throat> in doing so, he used the tools and practical skills he knew from advertising and the commercial design world. He then applied those tools to the revolutionary movement and context, and he developed this amazing, surprising, bold, completely new look that captured the world, along with other designers who were part of uh, their work and their movement. These bright colors, simple but arresting images and bold topography was, uh, was something that he developed and it was a really important part of the, the development of the visual language of, of these Cuban posters. Another key figure of Cuban poster design, Alfredo Rosgart, said, we wanted to create a means of communication that was immediate directly or indirectly, but at the same time original. We did not reject any method or technique that would make our posters effective and modern. So Beltran, Rosegard, and others, examples shows us that while we must recognize and respond to context in the political moment, we must not shy away from the tools that work, tools that are often wielded and weaponized by the ruling class. So I'll talk a little bit now about the foundation, the uh, the practice the practical ways that these posters were produced. The artistic style that Felix Beltran and other early designers of the revolution developed, it was not a coincidence or random. The style of Cuba's revolutionary art is, is very different than other forms of art that came out of uh, socialist projects of our time, both in aesthetics and form. Sometimes our artworks require large or expensive paintings or hyper-realistic forms, um, as well as, uh, you know, ex hyper-expensive or, or different ways of production. But posters didn't take this approach. They were movable, economical, approachable as a medium. So the development of a new, contemporary, unique artistic style and form was very much supported and encouraged by the revolution's leadership. Fidel Castro said, our enemy is imperialism, not abstract art, in his letter to uh, intellectuals. He also said, the revolution cannot attempt to stifle art or culture when the development of art and culture is one of the goals and one of the most basic objectives of the revolution, precisely in order that art and culture will come to be a genuine patrimony of the people, and just as we have wanted a better life for the people in our material, material sphere, so do we want a better life for the people in all spiritual spheres and a better life in the cultural sphere. And just as the revolution is concerned with the development of the conditions and the forces which permit the satisfaction of all the material needs of the people, so do we also want to develop the conditions in which we will permit the satisfaction of all the cultural needs of the people. So the development of this new art form, this visual language, wasn't just for export or to make a splash, but it was an intentional development by the revolutionary movement to develop their socialist project and to enrich people's lives, material and culturally. It's a reminder of why we fight. We don't just want basic needs 
but we're fighting for art, for culture, for pleasure, and for enjoyment too. The ideological support of new ways of art making in support of the revolution created an environment ripe for the development of this bold style in the context of a developing Cuba. So in both the, the internal, national, and international artworks, other important elements of the current moment in Cuba played an important part in the visual language itself. Many of the posters included little or maybe not even not, no, not any text at all, which was important because uh, this was in the context of mass illiteracy um, right, at, right as the revolution was developing. It's an important element that we're able to kind of see, we're, we're able to see through these posters the development of a style and one that, uh, one that started and, and shifted a lot during its, its process. So I'll talk now a little bit about internationalism and its spirit and practice. What does it look, what does it look like to be an internationalist or to build an internationalist project. Cuba, it's a beacon of hope in a lot of ways in terms of what internationalism can and should look like. It is an example of true sacrifice, solidarity, and friendship between peoples. And this is a true artist, and, and it, it, this comes through in its artistic production as well as its other forms of diplomacy and support. A 1971 mission statement from the Congress on Education and Culture in Cuba says, the art of the revolution will be internationalist. At the same time, it will be tightly bound to the national roots. We shall encourage the legitimate and combative cultural expressions of Latin America, Asia, and Africa, which imperialism tries to destroy. Our cultural institutions shall be vehicles of the true artists of these continents of the neglected, of the persecuted, of those who do not want to allow themselves to be domesticated by cultural colonialism and who fight together with their people in the struggle against imperialism. So Cuba took an obvious, dignified, well thought out and deliberate stance in developing an inter internationalist culture. But it didn't just sprinkle art on top of internationalist further fervor or instill a certain subject matter on artists or art making. Rather, Cuban art and artists were embedded in internationalist processes, a, a part of key political movements and moments. One example of this is that at the height of the brutal Vietnam War, or as is called in Vietnam, the American War, who was sent to Vietnam to see the situation on the ground, but artist and head of the design team uh, in, in an organization in Cuba, Rene, Rene Medeiros. He marched with the liberation forces on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and based on his experience, built a body of work that recognized both, imp both imperialism's horrific violence and the people's dignified revolutionary resistance. And, and his work you can see on this wall over here, um, Como in Vietnam. So this experience undoubtedly influenced his work, but is also a testament to the seriousness with which with the art was, was and should be taken, not only as symbolic or aesthetic, but a serious weapon of internationalism to be used against imperialism across the globe, a practice of action and embedded within political movements rather than separate from it or simply an attachment. So finally, how do we think about the amazing legacies of these posters in our, in our context today, 2023, from within the belly of the beast? We must learn from the way the artists and designers of Cuba understood their internal context and built a culture of art and visual language that made sense and spoke to the people in that time and place. As artists today, we can't just copy and paste the style, but we must employ the, true, the two tools of a true revolutionary internationalism, study and use the tools that work to communicate in order to expand and develop our art practices today. So again, I'm really, really so happy to be opening this exhibition of posters. I hope you enjoy them and um, take some time to, to look at the, the 
the artworks and their subjects. And now I'm honored in a kind of conversation about what it looks like to build revolutionary art and culture today to invite to the stage artist Jasmine Nicole Williams. <laughs> Jasmine is a printmaker, a muralist, and an organizer from Atlanta, Georgia. Her work has been showcased at Prism Art Fair, Perez Museum, Miami, Zucat Gallery, iDrum, Mint Gallery, and Echo Contemporary. She has received residencies from Hambridge and Midtown Alliance. And currently, she is the 2023 recipient of Living Walls Abroad Fellowship, and she'll be painting a mural of Elizabeth Catlett in Mexico next month. She's also teaching a printmaking class with the People's Forum this weekend. So hopefully some of you here are going to be in that, in that workshop. It's going to be really amazing. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it to you, Jasmine. Hey, y'all. Um, I really appreciate y'all coming out. This show is amazing. I'm really grateful that um, the people of the People's Forum asked me to speak today. Um, so um, in my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience as an artist, um, journeying through you know, the belly of the beast, becoming an organizer, and how that's fortified my work, and how I want to um, inspire other artists to let organizing and taking up class struggle um, to fortify their work. So I'll start in college. Um, I studied printmaking and sculpture, and I minored in Africana studies at the University of West Georgia. I was drawn to printmaking because of, like Hannah said, like the, the nature of multiples, um, how it is like cheaply made. I don't know if cheap is a good word, but whatever. But it's like made and is extremely accessible to the people. And because of the nature of multiples, it can move around the world in, in, in wonderful ways. Um, I was deeply interested in linking my artistry to social justice and politics. Um, I was in school between 2012 and 2017, so um, the, you know, the killings of Mike Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, all happened during my undergrad graduate um, term. Um, so I joined the NAACP, but like quickly became disinterested in organizing. Um, and while I moved through school, I was like always told by my professors and my capstone committee that like you're technically a great printmaker. You can carve a piece of wood like nobody else. But there's like a little bit of a disconnect there. Um, and I think that was because my work focused mostly on the struggles of black men so and boys and their interactions with police and with society. Um, but I didn't want my work to be like on my chest. I didn't want it to be too close to me. It was, it was too much. Um, so I shifted to a more personal narrative, um, and I centered my, um, my black, queer, woman experience in the, in the U.S. South. Um, so I graduated in 2017, and um, I finished with a thesis called Five Fifths, so it was, it was really cool. Um, but after college, uh, 2018 was like a whirlwind. I was kind of thrust into the art world. I got an international... Um, fellowship through uh, Southern Graphics Council International, which is an international printmaking conference. I did countless shows in all different sectors of the art world, and that all culminated in an experience in 2018 where I showed at Art Basel, um, and there I saw like the spoils of the art industry, like the great wealth that was exchanged, the range of work, and the people that were there. Um, there was some work that I saw that was like, what is what is this? What is the point of this? And other work where I was like deeply moved. Um, also, while I was there, I was advised by arts administrators that were deeply rooted in institutions in Atlanta um, to like hide myself. I was like on social media and showing people my art process um, because that's like the nature of printmaking to just share with everyone. Um, but they were like, you need to create a little bit of mystery. You don't need to give all your secrets away. Um, so that led me to a little bit of isolation and feeling disconnected from like the very people that I make art for. Um, in 2019, I did my first mural in Summer Hill. It was with the city of Atlanta. And while it was deeply fulfilling, I was grossly underpaid. <laughs> um, but it 
it reminded me of like why I love printmaking, like lowering the barrier of entry for art, giving it directly to the people. And it just felt like the ultimate manifestation of that. Um, so I did more murals, I did more art shows, but I was like quickly being disillusioned by my studio practice and, and making prints for galleries and museums. Because I was like, who is this work for? If it's not for the masses, like these people are just like, they're just buying this work to, to like increase their portfolios. Like, I don't want that. Um, <laughs> so I kind of moved away from creating art or um, art in my studio and printmaking and just focused on murals. In 2020, I moved into, um, I saw all of my friends like joining political organizations and getting deeply rooted in um, politics and studying. And we engaged in collective study together. Um, and that was when I shifted from like an identity first analysis. I was like centering my black experience and my queer experience, which is incredibly important, but I kept feeling like I was hitting a wall. Like I was like, okay, black people are treated like crap. What's next? Um, and I shifted into a class first analysis. I felt like my, 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 the tools for shifting the world changed greatly. Once I started thinking about the class struggle, um, and it really started sparking me to pick up my carving tools again. I was like, I need to, I need to make a print. I need to print some, I need to print some stuff. I need to send some stuff out, you know? Um, so in 2022, I, after years of deep study, I was finally moved to, to join an organization and start organizing. And I didn't fear that fatigue that I felt before, that fatigue of fighting in the belly of the beast because I knew I had comrades that would help me and trusted me to, to build the stamina to continue the fight. So I was graciously invited by the International People's Assembly to go to Cuba in April during their May Day Brigade. And um, when I first was asked, I literally tried to not go. At every turn, I was like, I don't got the money. I don't got the time. I only got a passport, y'all. Like, I was just, like, not feeling it. Um, but really, that fear was a fear of my potential to grow. It was a fear of what happens on the other side of this experience. Because I knew I couldn't turn back after that experience. And I wouldn't turn back. <laughs> so, you know, as I was like going to Cuba, I learned about Jose Marti, a poet and a journalist and revolutionary that inspired Fidel and his comrades to make revolution and win. And Fidel understood the role that arts played in sustaining the culture of a people's revolution. And while in Cuba, I, <laughs> my mind exploded because every nook and cranny of that country oozed that revolutionary spirit. It was from the cultural institutions and community centers to city squares and like people's homes, like the gates to their homes were like, what, this is insane. Um, and it lit a fire in me. It, I wanted to spread the good news about Cuba. <laughs> and I wanted to inspire and, and ignite the spirit of artists across this country to take up the class struggle. In the U.S., artists are encouraged to isolate. Um, well, honestly, people are encouraged to isolate from our commutes, um, from our homes, our work. Like, we are drawn into ourselves. And as artists, we are also taught to draw into ourselves. If you think about painting and drawing and designing, um, we, we have to do that in the corners of our lives or in our studios by ourselves. And printmakers are a little bit different because of, you know, printmaking presses. Our tools for making work are extremely expensive. So we're typically in shared spaces. So I have a deep appreciation for working in community with people. And artists have to understand how the ruling class uses our peculiar position in society as squarely working class people, but we hold the power to inspire the masses to make and win revolution. Um, most artists that I know went from low wage jobs to their artist career. <laughs> there was no in between. You went from working for 725 in Atlanta to 
getting $700 for an art piece. You know what I'm saying? So as cultural workers, we need class consciousness to combat the cynicism that comes from our work being exalted, yet super exploited by the working class. Artists in the U.S. have to understand that art only has one of two functions. Either it's upholding the established hegemony and ideology of the U.S. ruling class, lullabying the masses and ushering them towards death, or the work can empower the masses to continue the class struggle that liberates every corner of this planet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and while every bit of our indoctrination will lead us to believe that this fight has to be forged by ourselves, this exhibition proves that we are part of a long legacy of revolutionary solidarity and with our skills, our power, and our might combined with political education and a deep love for people, we will win this world. So, <laughs> I appreciate y'all and I appreciate the class struggle for igniting me to, to engage with my practice on a very deep level and um, yeah, thank y'all. Thank you so much, Jasmine. What an amazing way to open this show, to get excited about these, this history, uh, this history of posters and to envision what, what it looks like today to make art in, in our context and in the context of our struggle. Um, so I wanna thank you all again for being here, for celebrating this work. Uh, let's stay in touch. Let's continue to talk and mingle as we, as, as we enjoy these works. Um, and just before we go, I want to say that the People's Forum, we're celebrating five years this year. We've, since 2018, we've been um, learning together, we've been dialoguing, we've been building and fighting for a better world. Uh, we have tons of courses. There's another class happening upstairs right now. We're having cultural events. Um, educational programming, and our goal this year for a five-year anniversary is to raise $150,000 to support our programming. So if you have anything to spare, uh, we would really, really love to have you part of our celebration of, of five years. Um, and you can donate to the People's Forum's five-year anniversary fundraiser at fiveyears.peoplesforum.org or at the front of the space if you're in person today. So thank you again. Really, really happy to have you here as part of this opening. And uh, let's continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah.